Over to Sid. Thank you, Mal. On Tuesday, I started a theme which is going to just last till today because I think both sets of people get to try out the, the idea of identity, what that means to you in light of the current world situation. We're kind of grappling with the idea of identity here, to put it mildly. If you've got any ideas about it or if it strikes you in some particular way that you find interesting, please feel free to to jump in or chat down there and see what uh, comes back. It's not about starting a fight with anyone, not that that's possible in this group. It's about just learning something. For me, obviously, I've always grappled with the idea of identity in my life, being from at least two different cultures, both of which seem to be at war with each other from time to time. Uh, And there's a third culture, Arab, the African and British that has also got into the mix. And so I'm really confused about myself uh, and be curious to know what you think about yourselves. Anyway, wheel in the first person for an inquisition. Yeah, bring your A-game, people. Um, <laughs> we're going to start with Ellen. Hello. I have this virtual background. My daughter changed it last time she was in a meeting. And for the life of me, I can't figure out how to get rid of it. It's pretty cool. It looks, I mean, it, it marks the, uh, the, uh, the SpaceX mission to the uh, station really nicely. You could be on the station for all I know. <laughs> Where are you in the world or not in the world? I'm right outside of Philadelphia in Conshohocken. So how are you? How is COVID treating you and your family, if, if I may ask? I'm a college professor. They, you know, cut off our semester right after spring break, sent us home. We had to do everything online. And I had my two kids at home at the same time. So oh it's goodness. been interesting. Wow. What do you teach? I- I'm a math professor. Oh, fantastic. I'm jealous. <laughs> I'm not jealous of you being a professor, although I think that's a pretty cool job. I'm jealous that you understand mathematics, something I am completely ignorant about. It's funny you should say that about the whole different language, because there was always a joke when I was in uh, graduate school that we should get, you know, some sort of language credit. (laughs) (laughs) So much of it with Greek symbols and everything that that we needed some sort of language credit for that. (laughs) What vein of mathematics are your is your particular interest? Is is it is a physics physics overlapping one or is it? uh... Uh, No, I'm more a theoretical mathematician. My thesis, which I haven't worked in it in, in years, but my thesis was in graph theory. Oh, and, yeah. um, I'm more of an educator right now. So yeah. my primary job is teaching. I don't have a research requirement. But you're teaching quite advanced mathematics, so I'm assuming, to a university crowd. I, I always say I, I teach whatever they need me to teach. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bunch of calculus, which, which I love because I, I'm also a certified secondary ed, so I, I love teaching calculus and, and that sort of thing. Oh, that's wonderful. Do the students miss you, miss the college, miss what's going on, or do you find that there's, they've adapted quite well? No, I know a lot of them struggled, especially teaching math. I'm so used to, I, I feel like I feel the room while I'm teaching, and I look at them, and if I'm doing a problem, and they're all looking at me with question marks on their face, then I'm like, okay, I need to go back, I need to redo something, or yeah. I'll put a problem on the board, and I'll walk around, and I want to see what they're doing. So not being in the same room with them, and I didn't do live lectures. I, I had colleagues who did live lectures online, but I have two kids, one of which is four, and the couple of times I tried to do things live, it didn't <laughs> I totally understand. I can see it. I can, I can picture it. Mom, 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 mom. There was one time she, she put on a chicken costume and could be seen in the corner of my Zoom. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I'm glad my students have a good sense of humor. That's priceless. Did, did you did you always did you always take your lectures? No. The week before we went virtual, I tried uh, while still in the classroom, only to discover that the cameras that they set up in the classrooms pointed towards the students and not towards the board. Hoping that they they do something to fix it before we go back because. Um, we're, we're hopefully doing a, a hybrid method where some kids will be there, some won't, and yeah. a lot could change before. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, because I, 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 when I sort of lazily surf, you know, if I'm not watching barbecue videos on YouTube, I'll occasionally go to lectures, you know, if, I'm, if there's something interesting, you know, some sort of element. And Mathematics 101 would be something I would absolutely watch. What identity do you see yourself as? I would probably identify myself as Jewish American. Okay, yeah, that's pretty cool. I think we've got a few Jewish Americans uh, in, in, in the club. Do you, do you, are you impacted by what, what happens 
on TV or are you impacted more by what, do you know that stuff or are you impacted more by world events, by, by kind of trends in the world? I definitely don't block it out. I'm trying to take it all in and try to take the next steps based on, on what I'm seeing, what I feel is best. Yeah. Yeah. And would you describe yourself as an activist at all? Not overly. Me neither, by the way. <laughs> I mean, I do. There, there are causes I support. Like I said, try to take it all in. But, you know, when I see something that I feel is wrong, I, I do tend to say something. Yeah. Do you mind me asking, really, do you have, are you married or, or together with a partner? No, I'm married. Do you share the same religion? We don't. What do you most like about the, non -U, the non-Jewish part, the American part of you? A discussion I had with my husband early on was, and, and this was before we were married or had children or anything, was that I identified as Jewish and I wanted to live in a Jewish household. That was something he was not against. So our children are Jewish. They're raised in a Jewish household. But our children know that, you know, daddy's family is not. And we go and we cel celebrate holidays with them. So we'll go celebrate Christmas. Easter over their house. They get Christmas gifts from his family and we give gifts. I really love that. I mean, I want, well, I'm really glad I asked you particularly because you happen to be married to somebody who's non-Jewish because there are so many wonderful things you get by reaching outside of your culture. Mm -hmm. That are fun, especially for kids. It's like, my goodness, really? We also get presents and other stuff, and uh, we don't have to do any of the, the, the boring stuff. But that's fantastic. Thank you. That's really interesting for me. What, I mean, obviously, you're, you're trying to teach them at home. So my youngest one is four. Uh, my older one's in fourth grade, and they're in their last week. Well, she just finished today learning new stuff in their online school. We're in a very good school district, and, and her school has been wonderful when they went to virtual. She, she's very intelligent. She hasn't needed terribly much help from me. What does she like to do? She is an avid reader, which I don't know where she gets it from because I was never much into reading. You know, math, I'm, I'm there, but she's an avid reader and she's been reading this new series called Wings of Fire. It's about dragons. Ooh. Is it, how many books? Is it lots and lots of books? I think it's something like 14 and she's on book six and it's like this thick and she... Oh just was like, oh, I read half of it today. <laughs> oh my goodness, oh my goodness. And does she have any other likes? Does she like to draw and stuff like that? Yeah, she likes to draw, you know, she's very much into playing video games and, and she wants to tell us every single aspect of what she's reading. <laughs> <laughs> But it's funny, she's, so she's been telling me about these books and she's talking about, oh, they're talking about prophecies. And I'm like, well, if you like prophecies, I, I have a TV show that you could watch. Yes, of course. <laughs> oh, yeah. She'd be, I wonder how she'd take to something like Deep Space Nine. I mean, she's obviously beyond her years, but it's, it's pretty advanced stuff. You know, now I look back at it, it, it is so tame. It's so not... I mean, by today's standards, it's it's not uh, controversial at all. Back then, it was it was pretty controversial for, for youngsters. Yeah, I was I was a teenager when um, when Deep Space Nine was on. Recently, I've been starting to watch it again, and I've been seeing so many new things that I never saw before. You know, I react sometimes. I mean, it, it, you can't help but do this because culture moves so quickly. I mean, you the one way you can tell how quickly culture moves is to watch a TV show just from four years ago, and it seems sexist. The show that didn't have any sexism at all when you're watching it. it didn't occur to you. But four years later, this show is, my goodness, they really thought that? You know, mm -hmm. uh, how are you doing, little women? I mean, you just wouldn't hit, you know, that's a ridiculous line. But 10, 15 years ago, that was actually happening quite regularly on TV. Watching it now, I have to say, like, I've been watching it with, and my husband's been watching some of it too. I don't think I realized how fantastic the acting was, to be completely honest. Like, watching it, and I'm like, wow, some of the, like, this is really, really good. But then there was this funny thing that we saw, and I know somebody will say the name of the episode. You guys go to this planet, and you end up finding that you had been sent back in time, and there was this whole new, like, civilization 
from the descendants of the defiant. But Odo wasn't able to hold his form and you put him in some sort of stasis thing. And my husband and I watched as you put him in a glorified bread maker. <laughs> so now we have this joke that we want to make Odo bread. <laughs> Odo bread is pretty good. A lot of that stuff was very kind of ad hoc. It was made kind of quickly. But the work on the sets was um, second to none. I mean, all of that, the, the stuff on there and the, the, all the little stickers, transfers they put everywhere to decorative stuff, you know, little, little teeny numbers on bridge, bridge heads and tiny things on the door, on, on doorways and stuff like that. But if you look carefully at them, they often have jokes on them. So because the camera would never get in that close. For example, I don't know what, you probably know what the speed of light is. And so they put, I don't know, X miles an hour. It's not just a good idea, it's the law. <laughs> <laughs> Stuff like that. If you look carefully, you'll see all these silly little jokes everywhere. Well, listen, it's been really lovely meeting you. Thank you so much. Hi. We are gonna go to Kyle. <clears throat> Hi. Okay. Yeah, I can hear you really well. Oh, good. I was worried about the technology of this. Uh, Doing great. New... Yeah, fantastic. Are you in New Zealand by any chance? No, it's just a, a fancy hat. I'm in Birmingham, Alabama. Ah, uh, it's um, it's a is, is it a is it a cricketing hat or is it a uh, definitely New Zealand? The all all blacks, I guess. Yeah, sort the of all black on the un unofficial. You know, national flag that they wanted to, yeah. to vote in a couple of years ago. Because their cricket team is also called the Black Caps, so they've oh. all got uh, they're all kind of in the all black territory. Uh, do you I'm watch uh, rugby? I do. I don't. I'm afraid I'm not a very big sports guy. But you should watch a thing called the Haka. You I know the Haka. It's amazing what they do before a game of rugby. Those guys. It's fierce. It's, it's so fierce. Fierce boy. Yeah. It's if I was opposing them, you're meant to just stand there and just take it. But it's meant to. <laughs> really imperil you, really make you terrified about the next 80 minutes of rugby. Um, it makes my knees knock uh, just watching YouTube. So you're in Alabama. That's right, yeah. How is yeah, life a, in Alabama? A confusing mixture of happiness and sadness. Yeah. It, it, it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Oh but it's a, it's a really pleasant place, actually. Yeah. I bet it's, uh, I mean, I, I'm jealous of the weather. I imagine it's really nice most of the year round. Yeah. Our winters have no teeth. We've got long, fat, broad summers and everything's green most of the year. It's a okay. very nice environment to just be in. Yeah. And do you live near a city or are you... Um, uh, uh, in, in Birmingham, the probably the largest city in the state. A million people in the metro, the larger metro area. So a, a small town by comparison to most places. Yeah. Um, one of the uh, birthplaces of the civil rights movement. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Uh, if you visit here, it's sort of, it's something you can't ignore. There's a really nice museum, a couple of them, uh, Civil Rights Institute that a lot of big political wigs come, come in from out of town. They always stop there. Um, yeah. Walking around downtown is a lot of history. And right now in particular with the uh, George Floyd stuff going on, there's yeah. a lot of resonance going on. And we have our own protests and some rioting, small scale stuff here. Yeah. But that history is never, ever, ever far away. How were you taught as a kid growing up about all, all that? Was it, were you seeped in the civil rights history or was it sort of up to you to do look into it by yourself? It was more or less up to your personal predilections. I mean, they taught about they taught it a little bit in, in high school and elementary school, but not as much as they should. Yeah, and it's yeah. probably, since I was in school, it's probably a lot different now. Uh, yeah. We'll probably go into more detail. But when I was in school, like... You just skim the surface and move along. And as an adult, walking around the museums and the parks downtown, you're like, really? X happened? Y happened? <laughs> How come yeah, no one told me about this? So that's like a constant sense walking around Alabama is like, like, how come no one told me about this? This is great. Yeah, that's astonishing. I mean, it seems that you have a really good appreciation of it. How would you identify yourself as a as a as a big umbrella issue? It's a tough answer. Tough question. I am a North American. That's pretty good. I like that. I just feel like whatever ethnic background I might have has been part of the ruling el the ruling ethnic group of the United States, and it's also been run through a ringer so it's been distilled down from some other random elements so i don't yeah yeah i don't know how to feel about that i agree with you but i think i think that north america is a really really good definition one of the reasons why i think it's it's very good is that you can you can attain to every person living in america to identify primarily as north america and that what, what that will do is that the stigma of being from a different culture must no longer exist if you all identify the same way and the stigma of being a particular uh, 
had a particular sexual preference, to a particular religious interest. All of those things will eventually wash out, one hopes. I grew up in the UK. I was born in Africa, moved to England at about four, and had to quickly, you know, get my act together, learn the language. When I got much older, uh, by the time I was in my 20s, early, early late teens, it suddenly started to go away, the, this constant reminder of who I was or what I, of what I looked like. I suddenly could just say I was British. And most people of colour, there's an African, a very strong African-Caribbean community in, in the UK. And to other British people, they will definitely say they're African-Caribbean, Afro-Caribbean. But if they're talking to a foreigner, they'll say, well, we're, we're British. British. Mm-hmm. Um, and we haven't fixed anything by a long way. <laughs> but it's still <laughs> kind of interesting. So um, that wasn't something that you, I mean, like it was pressed upon you from other outside cultural forces that you felt a bit in a, in a particular category, right? Yeah. I mean, Is that what you're saying? yes, kids, especially because well, between seven and 18, I lived at school. So I was a boarding student. Kids are always reminding you that you've got red hair or big teeth <laughs> or brown skin and they'll thanks, do it. Thanks, kids. <laughs> yes, exactly. They'll do it in the, m- the most cruel way they can, depending on how, their, how they feel. I think maybe kids are learning to, to be a bit more sensitive, but I, I can't blame them for not learning because kids are supposed to be kids. They're supposed to be brutally frank. I'm, I'm curious to, that the, your COVID thing is the best of times and the worst of times. Do you work? I do. Well, I mean, sort of. I, I'm an independent filmmaker, so all the production stuff at our level here in Alabama is ground to a halt. So yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. So I'm doing a lot of editing jobs. I, I run a couple of YouTube channels, and you know, fills in the gaps. It fills out the day, but it's certainly not the same. Everybody I know waiting. You know, so yeah. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I'm waiting. I don't know that I will work until they come up with an effective vaccine um, because I don't see how a production could get insured if you've got 200 people and you're not sure whether any of them have got COVID or what happens if they do. Yeah, and good luck social distancing on a set, you know? (laughs) Yes, exactly. Kyle edited the video from last Friday when Nana joined us. He's the oh, one put that together for us to put up on YouTube. That is you, Kyle. Thank you so much. Yeah, no worries. Thank you very much indeed. That's really uh, no problem much at all. Appreciate it. Um, do you was, write? Uh, was, uh, I do a little bit of that just for the YouTube stuff. I do video essays, so that requires like a little bit of crafted writing. My partner and myself have a, a U- uh, not a YouTube, but a, a podcast that requires a lot of writing. So I've suddenly found that I have to have fill in the blank spaces with some of that. So yeah, I mean, what is your podcast? Podcast called Wiki Surfer. Um, right. Uh, my partner and I, you start out like a random wiki topic and you know how you're reading an article and you find another link somewhere to a deeper rabbit hole to a deeper rabbit yeah. hole. We take that concept and we sprinkle it with a little bit of sound design. So we're telling stories with it. That's basically it. It's a lot of fun and you, you wind up in a place you don't expect every time. That is fantastic sounding. What is your YouTube uh, channel? Uh, this is going to be really uh, on on topic. It's a Star Trek science fiction theme channel called Trek Expertise. Oh, I've heard of it. I'm sorry if you're lost. <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic. So, and you do a lot of video essays for that I, I do yeah and what kind of form what what form do they take uh, it's like a kind of a regular high school or early college style essay kind of a thing you take a topic you expand it out you explain the reasons and then in a video form you decorate it with clips and visuals and graphics and stuff of that nature uh we've got channel uh videos on the channel about like how star trek represents homosexuality how it talk we a recent video is about how the franchise discusses terrorism for example stuff that's interesting to well me. We're, at some point we're going to do a kind of surprise um for everybody at the social club i can see myself getting in touch with you for some of your expertise is that okay with you absolutely that would be great I'm, i can't tell you what it is yet in the next two or three weeks um we're going to take it up a notch yeah. Well, I will get in touch. Thank you very much indeed. We're going to go to Petra. Hi, Petra. Hey. Welcome to the club. Hey, Max. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. my God. It's actually, actually happening in real time. Oh We're God. talking to each other through oh. the miracle of technology. Oh Where oh are God. you, Petra? Hello from Switzerland. <laughs> oh, brilliant. <laughs> Fantastic. I have waiting about eight weeks to get through to you oh, and listen not... listen i have to read it i have only started learning english five months ago so, wow. so don't please expect 
grammatically correct sentences. You won't get it. <laughs> Your English is very good for a five month. <laughs> Thank it's you. Really I, good. I didn't have it in school when I was a child. Because you learned what? What language did you learn in school? German. Just German. German and French. French. But I don't speak I don't speak French. <laughs> I don't speak. But do you live with your family? I live alone. But I have two cats. Okay. Is, is the COVID big problem in Switzerland? Not anymore. The, the numbers going down. It's it's much better. Good. You don't have to be so lonely. <laughs> you, can, you can go out. I can yeah. go anywhere in Switzerland. Yeah. Well, the, and you can also be in our club. <laughs> yes. And oh talk God. to us. <laughs> I tried to a bit, a bit to to write here in the chat, but I'm too slowly. Of course. And okay. and um, I have nobody to talk in English, so I started um, to read a book aloud. That's a that really can... good idea. Yeah. Did you watch uh, Star Trek? Yeah. Did you watch yeah. it? In, in, and now you can watch it in English. Yes, I started a few years ago to watch everything in English. Fantastic. So my, um, my English skills are not so bad. My, uh, my writing skills are not so bad. It's just the, the speaking, the talking. I think after one or two of the Chinese dialects, English is supposed to be the, the next hardest. Do you like music? Yeah, I like metal. <laughs> <laughs> I like within temptation. Do you like Metallica? Metallica? Yeah. At the moment, I listen only to Nightwish and Within Temptation. I love them so oh, much. That's yes. Fantastic. Great. Yeah. I haven't listened to metal for a long time, but I will try and remember to do that later on today just to scare my wife out of the house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What do you do to, to make money? Everybody here has such a fantastic job. I'm cleaning other people's flats and houses. Who, which apartment or flat? You don't don't tell us the name. But do you really not look forward to going to? Is there one person who you really don't like cleaning? <laughs> I like them all. You like them all. I like them all, and the the other ones are gone. <laughs> <laughs> I once in my life I had someone who who cleaned my apartment when I lived in Los Angeles but I always found myself cleaning before they arrived because I was so terrified that they'd see that I was a messy person uh, <laughs> I always just clean the apartment yeah. and then they'd come and I'd be like yeah well and you have two cats I have two cats yeah they are sleeping and you have family nearby uh, my parents live 15 minutes away, That's also in, a, in, a, away. In, another, in another town, but it's about 15 minutes. And do you do anything that when, because obviously now you can do any, anything in Switzerland, but three weeks ago you had to stay at home. Did you develop a, an interest, a, a, a different interest, a, a hobby, writing or drawing? I listen to music. And do you sing when you listen to yeah, music? Yeah, when I'm alone. I Fantastic. never sing when somebody is around. My wife thinks that she cannot sing, although she doesn't sing perfectly. She loves singing because it's it makes her feel good. So we play karaoke in with the TV in in um, in my my, in my room upstairs and we sing like we're singing on for a concert we sing loud and we sing happily it's quite good fun i recommend you yeah. do it as often as you can i have neighbors <laughs> ah yeah okay you've got to be careful with neighbors <laughs> I don't have a house. I have neighbors. Yes, yeah. <laughs> but I can I can show you my cat now. Yes, I, please. I'd love to see. Idea how? Oh I my goodness! Yes, this? I see them can both. Can you see it? Yes, I see them both. Okay. What What are they called? That those cats? Lea and Isla. Lea and Isla. And, and what Isla. kind of cat are they? Normal cats. No. I know, but ca no. cats, have, cats, cats have different models and mates, yeah. like cars. Do you have, um, are there lovely places outside where you, your town? Can you to go for a walk and things like that? Because Switzerland is so beautiful. Yes, I have, uh, I have a forest nearby. How far away are you from Geneva? Because that's the only place I've been. Yes, I live um, near Zurich. 
oh yeah, I, we shot a movie, a part of a movie in Geneva, Syriana. We hired a the, oh, the whole the whole floor of a hotel so that we could make that floor into just the suite that I hired for the, for the for the night. And we spent about two weeks there. And I remember more than anything else the the taste of hot chocolate that they serve in Switzerland. It is just delicious. It's just pure chocolate, isn't it, melting? Yeah. <laughs> there really is yeah. no secret to it. <laughs> this is Switzerland, yeah. the land, the land of chocolate and cheese. Absolutely, it's absolutely <laughs> delicious. Yeah. It was the best, and it was freezing cold, so I couldn't have enjoyed it more. You are so kind. It's been such a re a real pleasure to meet you, and your yeah. English is very fine. Thank you. Have a lovely evening wherever you are. Thank you. Welcome. And and thank you, Mel, for putting me through. You're welcome. I'm glad you, you could join us. Thanks, Petra. All right. Um, okay, so next we're gonna go to Pablo. There he Pablo. is. Pablo. Hi. Hi, how are you doing? Uh, doing pretty good. Enjoying these. I've been on these uh about a handful of times now and uh everyone seems so awesome and so lovely actually. Yeah, they are. <laughs> it's really it's actually quite bizarre. It's not it, it's not representative of the entire population. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean like uh you know, when you get the idea that like an actor or someone is going to be doing something like this, you kind of expect it to be, no offense, self-serving and boring in a sense. Oh, this um, is totally self-serving. But this I'm is a community. I like it. It's a community. Where well, of course. In the world are you, Pablo? Well, I live in a small suburban town called Buda, Texas, right outside of Austin, Texas. Oh, wow. And, yeah. So it's basically an extension of Austin right. uh, in all actuality. Absolutely. How, how is how is it there? How's how's things? How's tricks? Well, th things are good. I mean, God, it's been so long since I've left my house, to be honest. But uh, <laughs> I'm so sorry. Yeah, um, it's it's all right. It's all right. But uh, it's nice. It's a uh, Austin in the area around it is a great place if you love to eat and if you love to listen to music and watch movies we have like the alamo draft house here we have mm -hmm. uh you know texas barbecue and you know it's just it's a lovely place i would live few other places in the world honestly wow that's quite something how would you um identify i've been asking a few people it's a tricky question i always joke that i'm a melange of identities my mother's side of the family was uh a mix uh, of african and european my dad's side of the family are uh basque Puerto Ricans. I was born in Panama, which is where my mother's side of the family has been for like the past hundred years or so. I grew up, I would say, Afro-Caribbean as my identity with all the delicious food and great music, of course. No because my great-grandfather was also Irish from Dublin, my family had heavy Irish influences. I remember my great-grandfather who lived basically until 109. He was the only very pale person in my entire family. It was just fascinating. <laughs> Fascinating because, uh, you know, he refused to speak English. He called it the language of the oppressors. <laughs> he, he had a, uh, a deep, deep love of salsa music, you know, also cursing and like this weird mix of Spanish and Irish. So it was a fascinating upbringing, to be sure. Just a mix of cultures. You. Yeah, Absolutely. You're a real mess, aren't you? <laughs> you got it oh, all yeah. going on. Uh, yeah, well, I'm sure you can relate. You're a mix as I well. Absolutely. I absolutely can. Do you ever I sort of you do Irish stuff? Do you eat Irish stuff or do you listen yeah. to music? So especially growing up, my mother made sure like uh she would take me to like the Irish uh cultural centers and stuff. I always wanted to pick up the bagpipes, but bagpipes are expensive to be honest. You know, I would eat Irish food, I enjoy a Guinness every now and then. I wouldn't <laughs> say I'm like supremely Irish, but it's definitely a, a, a part of my culture in some ways. And I, I've traveled to Ireland a whole bunch of times have good friends there i love that you really just have a good old swim in every element of your culture you're a living example of what happens when you start mixing it up a bit. i think it was interesting what uh what kyle said i think there is a sort of thing that when you live in north america and especially in today's world you have to constantly battle of having different aspects of your identity stripped from you yeah. um especially your culture identity north america i think offers a unique opportunity that i used to live in london for a year because i went to the university of london and oh, uh me too. 
fun. Yeah, I'm a religious studies nerd, uh, which is also a huge part of why I like DS9, of course. So. <laughs> One thing I noticed in London is similar to North America is uh, the melange of cultures, like the big mix. You know, it's it's a little bit easier in these sort of places to, you know, be of multiple cultures and identities in one person, even if you feel like they conflict at times, you just feel like it's easier there. There's a, there's a difference that I've noticed growing up. I mean, when I was a kid, I, I worked in a store before I became an actor, before I went to acting school and after I left university. And then I went to work at this store called Hackett. And Hackett was basically a secondhand store, but it was really high-end secondhand stuff, like leather bags and stuff. We eventually started selling uh, really fancy clothes. I got, I was the only person not white obviously, in this group. Um, and I was invited in to, to, to parties and stuff. And I remember hearing, you know, you're the only black person we have, you, we have so you're going to be really entertaining for us. But I was literally invited because they wanted to introduce a black person to their friends. Oh, now, yeah. that doesn't happen anymore, thank goodness. At least I don't think so. Well, it, I mean, it happens sometimes in places. I mean, living in the American South, you kind of see it sometimes. Oh, yeah. But I love to travel. Let me see. Last year and the year before that, I had a great opportunity to go to China. What was interesting about there is they rarely see foreigners of any kind. Yeah. But in particular, they rarely see, you know, foreigners of color. And outside so, big cities. Yeah. 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 Outside big cities. Well, even like when I was in Beijing, I specifically remember being in the the Tiananmen Square area, uh, Forbidden City sort of area, people stopping me all the time because it's common for Chinese to come up and stop you if you're a foreigner and want to take we a have, picture. We have Chinese people in this social club. I mean, there's oh, cool. here and a couple of others. We've, and Maggie, yeah. I don't know if she's on today. Ni hao to all the Chinese folks out there. <laughs> now, Maggie just said ni hao to you, by the way. She oh, cool. Said, You've traveled incredibly well. Oh, yeah. It's what I spend most of my money on, that and books. I love to travel. One of my partners works for an airline, so it, I get a little bit of an advantage there. Absolutely love to travel. And at least two to three times a year, I try to go to a, a new country or to see friends in a different country and experience things that are, you know, outside of my comfort zone and uh, expand my mind a little, I guess. Absolutely. That's phenomenal. And do you have um, other people living in the house with you? Or are you uh, yes, yes. Uh, so a part of my identity as well is that I'm polyamorous. So I actually have two partners, and they're lovely. I've been with one for nine years plus, and another yeah. one for six years plus. It's been great. We have a wonderful household. We love to go to museums, eat, stuff like that. Yeah, it's nice. Has it been a challenge with the with the virus, or has it actually brought you closer together? Well, yeah, I would say it's brought us closer together. I mean, uh, one of my partners is very much a heavy extrovert, and so she's been having kind of a rough time with it. We've been supporting her as well. All in all, it's uh, it's been nice. We cook a lot. Uh, she started a sourdough starter, of course. But yeah, everything she's been making is like sourdough. It's uh, It's been delicious. Uh, I like sourdough, so. <laughs> well, you have a really interesting life. I mean, everything about you. Um, is fascinating. Well, I hope we see you again one of these. Oh, likewise, likewise. Thank you. Take good care, my friend. You too. Thank you. All right. Next, we're going to go to Caitlin. Hi. Who I believe has a special day coming up as well. Yeah, I hey. share a birthday with Poppy. Oh my I'm, goodness! Happy I'm in the birthday. U.S., so it's tomorrow. But yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, happy birthday for tomorrow. Thank I hope you. you do fun <laughs> stuff. Whereabouts are you? I'm in L.A. You have an eclectic looking room there. <laughs> you get through a few books by the looks of things. Yeah, my husband and I are both, to quote David Malky, we're bibliophibians. <laughs> <laughs> That's really cool. I've never heard that term before. <laughs> do, you, do, you have, do you have more people in the house or is it just you guys? Just the two of us and we have two cats as well. And you have so. two cats. What made you drive a lot of for, for work? So I'm a musician and I also uh, am a teaching artist. Driving to gigs or my teaching jobs it just takes me all over the place. You have to go where the work is, you know. Fantastic. And what, what do you play? Viola. Oh, beautiful. What a fantastic choice. It's one of the most unusual choices to Viola because it's it's the kind of, it's like Deep Space Nine on Star Trek. Kind <laughs> of, yeah. yeah you know? It's the middle child. Yeah, I mean, when I started playing, it was 
was in my school's orchestra, I was like, I want to play the cello, but they were trying to create, you know, a well-balanced orchestra. And I think like I was smaller than some of the other people who wanted to play cello. So my teacher was like, oh, you should play the viola. It's almost exactly like the cello. I was like, okay. And then I got it. And I was like, this looks like a violin. I think you lied to me. <laughs> of course, I like, as soon as I started playing it, I, I fell in love with it. It's a beautiful instrument. Do you have any um, recommendations of what people should listen to if they'd like to hear some viola? My favorite viola concerto is the Walton viola concerto. It's He's an English composer. I don't know. It's just so like melancholy and like, contemplative I really like it like I feel like a lot of concertos especially like piano or violin concertos are really like in your face let me show you how cool I am you know but that the Walton viola concerto is not like that It's wonderful. Do you prefer classical music or do you just very eclectic? You like you guys like everything? Super eclectic. Most of the performance experience that I have is with classical music. In terms of listening, I, I like to listen to just about everything. And I, I like, you know, learning about new music as well. I did a podcast. The guys who were doing it were really nice, but they haven't been doing it long. So they haven't really figured out the shape of what they're doing but mm -hmm. it's called esoterica the idea behind it was think can you think of a, a, a rare or unknown album can you share it with us i gave them a choice of three albums i just put them out there because i just did this thing and i um searched my soul do you have a rare or interesting album I honestly like as much as i i enjoy new music I feel like I don't have like rare recommendations. I, I would say like one of my favorite artists is Bjork. Beautiful, like she's a great recommendation. Not rare, but like no, she's very but she's odd, wonderful. unique. Yeah, she's you know? odd for sure. Anyone who's interested in interesting music, I would say listen to Bjork. <laughs> I, I would wholeheartedly agree. So tell me what, what how you identify. Well, I identify as a violist, obviously. I identify as an Angelino. My mom's family is from Jamaica, so I identify as half Jamaican. That's got a lot of crunchiness to it because we're white Jamaican, but there's obviously like non-white heritage there, but like my white racist relatives didn't want to acknowledge it. And so, you know, like I feel like I want to like dig that up, but like it's hard, you know. <laughs> Really interesting. Do you think they were white British uh, Jamaicans? Yes, because British. They were uh -huh. generally British, the white people in Jamaica. Yep. Mm -hmm. Holdovers from the kind of colonial period. You see a lot of documentaries in England about the subject um, mm -hmm. because we're exploring our, our our past over there. And yes, they, they but they actually they're very integrated. Most of my mom's cousins who grew up there moved away. So like I have family, like huge Catholic family, you know, just like spread basically throughout the commonwealth southern u.s accents we've got me like on the west coast we've got australian accents british accents and a couple who are still in the caribbean i love this i love the fact that every, nearly everybody i've asked tonight um and uh, today and um, even on tuesday turned out to be a mix of all kinds of stuff and that was just that's fascinating and it gives me hope it gives me so much hope because you learn so much more about everyone else if you're mixed up totally <laughs> that's very cool and what does your partner do he works in programming interactive media so like virtual reality augmented reality um video games stuff like that i don't know if you have heard of the video game version of thoreau's walden but he was the lead programmer on that i've so. heard it. Of, it of course my goodness that's amazing his passion projects are creating new atari games <laughs> oh, <laughs> at least at the moment that is so cool mm -hmm. wow is he there yeah do you want to come say hi, Todd? Hi. Hello. It's a real <laughs> pleasure to meet you, sir. Pleasure to meet you, too. Your <laughs> wife is extremely proud of you. Well, I'm really glad to meet you. I don't mean to hold you here, but you have such an interesting work. Thank you so much. Do you have to, do you conceptualize from the beginning or do you come in late into a project and just, and help out? Pretty much from the early stages. Um, even things like, yeah, Walden, uh, I was there largely from the start, although we, we have kind of a, a research group who's done a couple different projects. And while the project went in a lot of different, took a windy path as we were trying to try out and discover a lot of things. Yeah, that was kind of working with the professor there who teaches game design and theory and such, as well as, as a lot of students who ended up uh, kind of maturing through because we're you know it's, it's a school as well as a lab it was really neat to see kind of effectively generations of students kind of learning a lot of these things so um yeah, yeah as, as a technical level 
yeah, I'm kind of the almost like the Scotty or the 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 person under under the the bridge. <laughs> this is a right and correct analogy in that for this one because <laughs> I'm I'm really interested in the fact that you arrived at a time when computer gaming and computer and this sort of technology you are right in it like in the very middle of it. Mm-hmm. How does it feel to be riding a crest of a wave? It's hectic on a, on a weird level. It's there is kind of the weird part of being either a little too early or the fear of being a little too late, and then you kind of also see a lot of little major waves and you know even within vr like oh do you want to go to augmented reality you know now with the, with the lockdown like telepresence is a huge thing and it's been amazing seeing i mean i i've a lot of the people i learned with kind of professors and mentors remember some of the early days where like they repurposed medical machinery because that was like that's the way you got computer graphics and like and they would kind of like hack those to do like early vr like in the in the, in the early 90s even and so it was interesting seeing kind of from their viewpoint how that's changed and and yeah but that's that said once it gets into the mainstream it's it's a whole other whole other ballgame it's, it's, whole other it's ballgame. really it's it's very hectic and, and a little overwhelming yeah absolutely i mean i'm i'm not a big vr fan i'm a, I'm a huge gamer have done have been most of my life I look, I've tried out the VR stuff. I, I just don't, I mean, it's a bit like 3D cinema, sense that anything that is de-socializes you, anything that cuts you off from your neighbors, right. it doesn't have a chance to survive in my view. You know, when you put that box on, your family don't know you anymore and you can't watch TV together. You can't do it together. But do you think that's, is, that's it's kind of hit as, is they trying to figure out, fix that? It's, it's interesting because you know, you're absolutely right. Weirdly enough, it's easier to socialize with somebody halfway across the world world than it is someone right next to you and i mean oddly like that was another weird thing is it was interesting like there's a whole theory about like a lot of technology particularly you know digital technology you know starts with experimentalists like people are hobbyists and it moves into a commercial or industrial purposes and and like the internet was very much like this where like you went to work and you had a computer but you didn't have one at home and then it hits mainstream and, and every time that happens we change the way we 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 interact with it and VR in a weird way. We were talking with they were talking with some movie directors, especially people who work like highly digitally. And a lot of them said we've been working with VR effectively, you know, for years now. It's like motion capture, or even people do like set lineups. If you're working on digital stage, you can have a director walk out and do kind of the oh, I want to I want the camera here. I mean, it's in VR, effectively. I mean, there might be looking yeah. at tablets and things, but it's you're working on a conceptually on a place that isn't really there. I mean, especially if you're doing sci-fi, like some of us back in the '90s, uh, a lot of green screen, a lot of uh, motion capture, a stop motion control, all these technical elements that you just have to. For people who don't know what that is, it's you, you create a scene, but the camera must do exactly the same things every time it does the take, so that you can put someone else in the scene who wasn't there before, which you can do much more easily now without even stop motion that's yeah that's really fascinating everybody's interesting here <laughs> everybody's fascinating even and, and you too in switzerland thank you both thank, i'm sorry to drag you in I, I'm, you didn't ask to be here but i'm very glad you arrived and thank you very much for doing that yeah. you're both really delightful thank you very much indeed thank you so much Thanks, Caitlin. Happy birthday. Thank you. Yes, happy birthday. All right. Next, we're going to go to Vicky. Vicky. Hi. Lovely to meet you. Gosh, it's good to meet you, too. I never thought I'd have a chance. We just finished doing a rewatch of Deep Space Nine, and it is amazing how well it's held up over the years. How fantastic. I'm gonna, I've am gonna. i got to stop for a second, because you've got this background, which is oh. enigmatic, to say the least. <laughs> What is going on there? Those are all my Star Trek figurines. They're fantastic. I, you know, I, because of the nature of the, the what looks like a wick, I thought it was a candle. <laughs> <laughs> That's the bit you liked. Yeah, well, I had Malcolm Reed since I watched Enterprise back in 2017. And this year I decided he was a little lonely. So you and Pavel Chekhov joined him shortly after my birthday. Deanna and Shran joined him... Uh, a little bit later. I am we're honored to be in the company, in your company, oh, all the time. You. There's a figure. It's the Trump oh, yes. figure. He keeps everybody in line. He keeps Malcolm from looking at Deanna's bum. So, uh, <laughs> so cool. <laughs> Whereabouts are you? I'm in Stockton, California. Yesterday, oh, okay. it was, yesterday it was 105 degrees, and now it's nice and windy, so it's only 87. Oh, my goodness. Can you even grow things in that kind of heat? Um, we can. My husband certainly does. He, yeah. he used to have a pool, but shortly after he was diagnosed as pre-diabetic, he, tur- he drained it and filled it up, turned it into a garden. 
and now he's growing tomatoes and peppers. Peppers do well in the heat. Yeah, they and do. And there's basil, all sorts of uh, wonderful things. Uh, do you cook all this? He cooks, I bake. I bake. You bake? Yes. See, that is something, I, that is a talent I would love to, to, to get to grips with. And I just think, think I, I just never have. It's like on it. That, that is your dog coming into the picture. This is Lucky. Lucky was out of the picture because his daddy came home and his daddy is the one who dispenses the treats. Oh, but, yes, uh, you are lucky. And he decided to <laughs> join me now that he's all treated up. It's lucky is almost 10. He was wandering the neighborhood when we met him. He was a two-year-old and he befriended our other dog at the time. His previous owners lived uh, around the corner, but they had a fence that was that had broken down a little bit and they just didn't bother repra replacing it. Oh. So he had the roam of the neighborhood. And then one day the pound picked him up. Oh, my goodness. Well, he seems lovely. He's very sweet. It's just amazing how devoted he is to me. My mom had dogs, but they were all devoted to her. So I'm still getting used to being kind of You're an all the dog. attention. All the love, all the feeding. Yeah, and absolutely. So just, well, he's certainly food oriented. He just heard uh, rustling in the background. So he jumped off my lap again. That's got to be food. Yep, it's got to be. <laughs> <laughs> How do you identify? Uh, I guess I'm a nut bar American. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> nut bar. But my heritage is mostly, uh, I'm Swedish on my birth father's side and German on my birth mother's side. That much I know. I was talking in the chat that my gender seems to be my main identifier. I just try to keep an open mind best I can. It sounds like you do. And do you, are you interested in, in Swedish things and, and German things? Do you have, have you looked into that element of your uh, cultural history? I like Europe in general. I, I like the World Cup and I like Eurovision. That's probably as close <laughs> as I come to uh, investigating it. I'm more of an Anglophile than anything. Yeah, I'm guessing you're sort of central, central California. Is yes, we're 30 miles south of Sacramento, the capital. Oh, yeah. Okay. Wow. Yeah. You know, I was raised in Redding, which is uh, 180 miles north of Sacramento. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, okay. I haven't spent much time around Sacramento. I've been all the way up to Mount Chasta, but I never went inland at all. And I should have done because I've been really interested to see all that. I mean, until, you know, bumping into Nevada there. Obviously, you're, not, you're kind of in super desert. You're actually one of the hottest places in America. It's not so much desert. It's uh, it's an agricultural hot spot. We're known for asparagus in uh, San Joaquin County. Oh, wow. So so, do, so are we in this part of uh, Massachusetts. Hmm. Asparagus is all about asparagus, or grass, as they call it. I grew them from seed when I lived in Sussex, and that took seven <laughs> years. Did you eat any of your asparagus? Because there's nothing better than... Raw it's asparagus. Not, it's not ready to eat yet, but we have bought from a farmer's market, and my husband uses a uh, wonderful marinade on them, and he used to be able to uh, cook them on the, on the barbecue. They've come out really well. Yeah, they're delicious. When you first eat your first homegrown asparagus, you will never be able to eat another one again, another <laughs> store-brought one, because they are so delicious. Just snap it and put it in your mouth. Did you tell me, you didn't tell me what your husband does, or, or you didn't tell me what you do. We both used to work in journalism. I was a copy editor, and he was a page designer. Then I got laid off nine years ago, and he got laid off about three years ago. My goodness. I work from home. My workload was reducing even before COVID hit, so it's it's kind of in fits and starts, although yeah. it's getting there. And Chris, uh, being the uh, lover of gardens that he is, went to work at Home Depot. Oh, and perfect. He, and he now works in the garden in the garden department. Uh, that is perfect. That's a perfect enterprising thing to do. And also, yes. it's wonderful He's, discount uh, for all the stuff you need to bring home. I think Home Depot has a restriction on bringing stuff home because too many people would take advantage of an employee discount and then quit oh. like two weeks later. So uh, That's he's a shame. good boy. Yeah, he's a good boy. This is a project that he did for his supervisor. Wow. It's a sushi ban. It's apparently the name of the woodwork that's that's used. It's the number store in the Home Depot affiliate, and he made it for the uh, guy who runs the store. It's really cool. What what is it made of exactly? I'm not sure the wood. Cedar, he says. Oh wow, that's, that's amazing. Like, yeah, that's really I good. Know. I'll tell him that until my face turns blue. He's he's got all <laughs> sorts of talents. He's build stuff. He got a lathe for his birthday, so he's been working doing a lot of woodwork. Oh my and goodness. I love all that stuff. I just can't do it now. My wife's got into it. She's she made a cherry wood coffee table last year. 
Oh my goodness. Yeah. Good for uh, her. How about that? Exactly. How about them apples? Unfortunately, COVID put a stop to her, her woodworking plans this year. She did it because she didn't think she could. And she absolutely can. I asked him if there was anything he wanted me to show you. And he said no, but he is thinking of making a uh, Star Trek shaped uh, cutting board in the future. Oh, brilliant. Yeah. Tell him to get it, get, get one ready and show us. Will do. Looking forward to that. It's been lovely talking to you. Well, I'm thrilled to death to uh, finally talk with you, too. We're going to go next to Hannah. Hi, Hannah. <laughs> Got it. Hi, <laughs> Are you in the UK? Yes, I am indeed. I yes. So. How are you coping with all the thing happening? It is a challenge, I'll tell you that. I work in the travel industry. In our company, the majority is on uh, the furlough scheme that we have in the UK. It's, it's going to be a challenge. Uh, we do expect like redundancies and stuff, uh, even though the scheme exists, because the problem is there is just no business in our company we specialize on music touring so our clients are music artists that go on these uh, big global tours and right. that's probably the last thing in line that will be reactivated <laughs> it really it's oh, it's the entertainment goodness. industry is going to be last it is. So, it is. It's the least essential. We are the least essential, unfortunately. Well, we can do this. We can, we can, <laughs> we can figure out this. Unfortunately, yes. it doesn't give us any money, but we can do it anyway. I was curious if what sort of things did you organize? How did that go? What was that about? So my role is in, in the procurement, uh, so supplier contracting. Yeah. So I'm specialized in going out to hotels uh, to visit them and also for a big part to see if they're actually suitable to work with. So your side of the industry, I mean, there are a lot of divas and divos yes. <laughs> out there. You need to make sure it's right. Yeah. And, and so much is based on trust and building uh, long-term relationships with the suppliers to make sure they get it right certain things need to be done in a particular way if it's like a a music artist coming back from their concert or even a film production you know there are certain it's it's particular type of sport i would it say is. Is. and the artist is king you know or queen he, whichever way no tour is. manager the tour manager is <laughs> oh, forget no. about the artist Remember there was that famous apocryphal story about a rock band who insisted in their contract that they all the all the blue M and M's were taken. Oh out yeah, the, yes. My wife that is actually a true story. It's true, I'm sure. But my wife tells me that that was done not really because they cared too much about the M and M's, but they realised if that people yeah. like you would, went to the bother of making sure that was done correctly, yeah, the rest of their demands would be done correctly. Right. About right. So if you live um, so with. True. People? No, I I live on my own, so for me it's it's relatively easy to to have a lockdown. I'm a relatively introverted person, so it, it's a bit of a breather as well. I yeah. must say, not yeah. to work. I've yeah. worked quite hard the past ten years. It's very um, stressful. Yeah, yeah. It, it can be. So this is very weird. This is yeah. just surreal. That's the, I think the best uh, descriptor to it. What have you done with your with your sudden time? All this time. I've rested, Good. which is something I truly needed. Yeah. That I really needed to embrace. I, I live in the current place for five years now. I discovered like a total green space, not even 10 minutes away, right. which I'm like, where did this come from? This yeah. is great. It's you uh, basically about yourself that has surprised you. Now when everything is hitting the fan a bit more, I'm actually like, I'm all right. In sense of, I'm actually less negative now than people would expect me to be. And less, um, than, than and less pessimistic. Absolutely. Yeah, my, my colleagues. Yeah, it, it sounds to me that you're not a necessarily a pessimistic person, but you're just hyper-rational. Not always. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> not always. No. <laughs> but I, I do. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Absolutely. You know? <laughs> how do you, uh, how would you, uh, just as uh, your umbrella identity? I have thought about the question because you were uh, asking this. How do I, how have I introduced myself in, in the past to other people? Um, because working in international environments and one thing sp uh, springs to mind and it's a bit similar to what Cal was saying with North America I very often deliberately have 
introduce myself as like, yes, I'm Hannah and I'm from Europe. And this actually comes from the time that I was living in New York where I thought like, okay, I'll just start with Europe. Uh, if they ask further, I will say uh, I'm from the Netherlands and Germany. That will right. already confuse people. <laughs> uh, the Netherlands is sometimes a bit obscure for, for, for the people I've encountered uh, outside of the workplace. And then there, then as soon as I say near Amsterdam, okay, they start and talking like, about oh, drugs. And yeah. then I'm like, <laughs> so yeah. I start with Europe. <laughs> I'm a true European. <laughs> a European is perfect. It's a lovely <laughs> What gives you pleasure? The other things, that you, do you have any other activities that you may be discovering that give you pleasure? I've tried to sort of master making gluten-free bread one day i will nail it uh i've i've made so many mistakes it's hard. And, uh, it's so hard and especially if it's gluten-free because you don't have any elasticity yes, in it you've got no chemical um, going on there yeah my mother made bread and she made bread all the time so i have a really romantic uh, uh, affection for bread making because when we i was growing up there'd always be bread i kind of let all that go um, for years and years and years and frankly i had a bad memory because i had to knead the dough and i found oh, that yeah. so hard after about 15 minutes it was really difficult Good. but i will I'll, I'll make another a sourdough starter because why not so you should yeah absolutely. you should post the recipe on on the website my, uh, I think those. It's really difficult to write it logically and not, you know, in a, in a concise, easy manner. The recipes can just be very boring if you're not careful. Have a terrific day and see you in a few days. You too. Thank, Thank you. you. See you next time. <laughs> Bye. Thanks, Santa. All right, Hannah was the last person that we were going to talk to today, but um, said a lot of people in the chat would really appreciate a tomato update if you have anything to Hannah's share. doing good. The little green chilies arrived too because we've got growing some jalapenos out there and we've got the first little itty bitty potato tomatoes, which are going to be huge um, one day. I will take a photograph every now and then. Yes. Exactly. What type of tomatoes did you plant? We've got three different kinds. I can't remember their names. They're like weird names, like Aardvark West. Not actually that. <laughs> Doesn't but sound yeah. appetizing at all. <laughs> <laughs> I, will, I will get, I will find out and bring, bring it in. Okay. Aardvark West is my Wilco cover band. <laughs> That's awesome. Brilliant. All right. Thank All right, you, everybody. everybody. Thank you have so a great much. Weekend. I hope you have a really lovely weekend.